Democrats keep asking for donations, despite having not acted on abortion for decades. All right, guys, hello and welcome to another episode of Thinking Out Loud. Today we're going to be discussing Roe v. Wade again. We're going to be discussing some of the emails coming out from Democratic officials, including Nancy Pelosi, that are asking for more uh, financial contributions, uh, reminding people to vote Democrat uh, in November for the midterms, despite the fact that over several decades, over generations, they have continually failed to act on abortion legislation to codify Roe v. Wade into a legislative right. Now let's go ahead and jump right into this today. I got a tweet here to start you off with from Left Voice it says, folks, Democrats had 50 years to codify Roe v. Wade into law. They didn't. And it's because they only care about social issues to the extent that it will help win votes at the ballot box. No surprise to any of us. This tweet goes on to say, Don't let Democrats convince you they're hapless victims on a sinking ship. They're not. They know exactly what they're doing, and it's never in the interest of the working class. Another tweet here from L. Bird says, It's been 10,747 days since the Democrats could have first codified Roe v. Wade into law. Now, it looks like there's a little bit of a discrepancy between those two numbers, 50 years, as compared to 10,750 days. Um, you know, 30 to... 30 to 50 years, 30 to 50 years, um, obviously not throughout the whole thing because, um, there's been periods of strong Republican governance, uh, you know, such as the Reagan era. Um, but still there has been plenty of opportunities for Democrats over the years where they've had a majority in Congress, or they've had, you know, some degree of legislative power, including under the Obama administration when he had a super majority where Democrats could have codified Roe v. Wade and other women's reproductive health um, cases or, or, or legislation into law. Uh, they, could have pre- they could have taken steps to protect these rights from being overturned in the Supreme Court, right? Uh, and we're going to really dive deep into this. Uh, we're going to show how not only have Democrats failed to act on this issue and therefore do not, by any stretch of imagination, deserve your vote. We're going to show how they've not only failed to act on this issue, but they have actually in tandem collaborated uh, with Republicans that are anti-choice, with Democrats that are anti-choice as well. So the first thing I want to share with you guys here is a tweet from Joe Biden. Uh, let's see here. It says, looks like this is from when he was running for president. It says, Roe v. Wade is the law of the land, and we must fight any and all attempts to overturn it. As president, I will codify Roe into law and ensure this choice remains between a woman and her doctor. So that tweets from 2019 or 2020 during the presidential bid here. And then let's go back here. Let's hit rewind just a little bit. Let's go back to 2006. I got this quote from Joe Biden right here. 2006 says, I do not view abortion as a choice and a right. It's always a tragedy, and I think it should be rare. So what's going on here? A couple of things. First off, I mean, this is, you know, it feels stupid even talking about it. Um... But here we are. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and say it and lay it out. Um, politicians lie to you. Yeah, they lie to you. Okay, they tell you what you want to hear. They tweet out what you want to hear. They give a speech that's a little bit different, or even a complete flip flop, depending on what region of the country they're in, man. Okay, they do this to get the votes. Okay, it's not because they care about the issues. Like I said in those earlier tweets, they don't care about these issues. They're wedge issues that are politically divisive, okay, that allows people allows politicians to turn one against the other so that they can maintain the status quo, okay? It allows them to have this issue always sitting up here, oh, we'll get to it, oh, we'll get to it, you just have to elect, you just have to elect me. You just have to donate to our campaigns. If you donate to our campaigns, we'll do this. Okay, it's a giant cash cow. Abortion rights in particular is a giant fucking cash cow. Okay, they're always going to put that yardstick a little further down. Okay, they raised probably millions of dollars, the Democratic Party, every single year telling people, oh, you know, donate to us so that we can codify Roe v. Wade so we can protect abortion. Every single year they raised millions of dollars just on that issue alone. Why the fuck? 
would they ever get rid of that issue? Why would they ever do something about that issue when it means they can make money off it every single year, every single election season? Why would they get rid of it if they know that they can secure votes on Oh, we're going to... And people fall for it. 50 fucking years, like those earlier tweets said, 30 to 50 fucking years they've had the ability at at, uh, different times to codify this, to protect this, to pass legislation to make sure that it's a right for women, and they never do it because they know that they can keep putting that... uh, that finish line farther down, keep getting money off of it. You know, it's the same thing. Um, I can't remember exactly where this came out of. I'm sure you guys have seen it in a meme or something by now. Um, but big pharma executives talking about at some seminar TEDx type thing. Um, you know, we have to ask the question if curing patients is a sustainable business model. I mean, this is the same kind of thinking. Okay. We know we can make millions off this. We know we can rally mass support on this issue. Why the fuck would we ever do anything to uh, to change it to to protect this right? You know, it's politics. Politicians lie to you. Like I said, every different country, every different uh, region of the country, they have a different fucking speech. Or even if you look at the newspapers, they'll print different things from that speech. Or they'll, you know, spin the narrative that this politician's a little lighter on this issue that you don't like. So they can get votes. Okay, it's politicians. I shouldn't have to explain it to you. It should be obvious. And yeah, there it is. Joe Biden, 2006, saying, I don't believe abortion should be a right or a choice. It's a fucking tragedy. You know, probably a speech or, or, or some kind of memorandum um, directed to a more conservative audience. Okay. And this isn't the end of it with Joe Biden either. I got this right here for you guys from the New York Times. It says, Joe Biden's paid speech buoyed the GOP in Midwest battleground. The caption here says, Joseph R. Biden Jr. spoke to a Republican-leaning audience at an economic club of Southwestern Michigan event three weeks before the 2018 midterm elections. So this article I'm going to read here for you guys is an example not only of the doublespeak of the the promises that turn out to be lies to mobilize um, cash grabbing and to secure um, votes for the election. You know, Democrats, including Joe Biden... Go further than that. They don't just lie and stretch the truth to try to get you to vote for them. They actively support politicians that are anti-choice, that are forced birthers. Okay. Why do they do this? There's a lot of different reasons. One is the system of graft that we live in uh, uh, under as a political system in the United States. You know, for instance, this here, we'll get into it. The guy that he gave a speech for that's part of the GOP had made a huge donation to some cancer research. You know, I scratch your back, you scratch my back. So somewhere along the way, this guy that Biden gave a speech for that we'll talk about scratched Joe Biden's back, okay? And somebody was running against this GOP candidate, and it looked like this GOP candidate might lose. It was very neck and neck. And so he said, hey, Joe, remember when I scratched your back? Well, I'd like it if you could scratch my back. Okay, so that's one example of why they do this. The other reason why they do this is something that we've seen more recently where you have actual progressive candidates running for office and likely looking like they're going to win. Uh, We'll see with this and with other examples from Democrats, they will gladly support GOP right-wingers, even hard-right, alt-right right-wingers over progressive candidates. Why do they do that? Because it's a duopoly. You know this. Both of these parties are beholden to capitalist interests. They are both right-wing parties. They are both capitalist parties. The only difference is the narrative that they spin out to appeal to different masses of electorate, right? So that's another reason why they do this, okay? Because their interests do not reflect working-class interests. They do not reflect the interests of social issues. They reflect the interests of capital and capital alone. So let's read a little bit of this article here, guys. It says, Joseph R. Biden Jr. swept into Benton Harbor, Michigan, three weeks before the November elections. In the midst of his quest to reclaim the Midwest for Democrats, he took the stage at Lake Michigan College as Representative Fred Umpton, a long-serving Republican from the area, faced the toughest race of his career. But Mr. Biden was not there to denounce Mr. Upton. 
Instead, he was collecting $200,000 from the Economic Club of Southwestern Michigan to address a Republican-leaning audience, according to a speaking contract obtained by the New York Times in interviews with organizers. The group, a business-minded civic organization, is supported in part by an Upton Family Foundation. So that's something I didn't touch on. I guess I did a little bit with the graft, right? Exchanging favors. Sometimes it's not even exchanging favors. Sometimes it's just, hey, come and talk to boost this fucker up and we'll give you 200 Gs, as in the case of Joe Biden here, huh? Going on here says, Mr. Biden stunned Democrats and elated Republicans by praising Mr. Upton while the lawmaker looked on from the audience, alluding to Mr. Upton's support for a landmark medical research law. Mr. Biden called him a champion in the fight against cancer and quote unquote, one of the finest guys I've ever worked with. So what do we got here? We got a few different things. Like I said, that's essentially these speeches like we remember with Hillary Clinton after 2016 uh, going into 2020 in those inter intermediate uh, presidential election years. You know, she made cash cow of fucking money off of speeches to big banks, to all this and that. Obama did the same thing once he was done with his presidency. I mean, it's just... A cover for bribes, outright cash bribes, because they've gotten too lazy with the 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 regular form of uh, of graft of corruption of the you scratch my back, I scratch yours type of thing. They just want the fucking cash, man. They want the cash. You know, Hunter Biden's got to have that extra money to fucking sniff coke off of strippers' asses and 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 fuck prostitutes in Ukraine. You know what I'm saying? So that's one thing here. They got the these paid speeches. At the end of the day. I, other than for the fact that they're trying to do PR, public relations, uh, save good face, uh, you know, they don't give a fuck who's paying. It can be a bank, it could be a Republican, it doesn't matter, right? And the other thing here is he swept in and helped this guy out, as we'll see, when this race was neck and neck. So let's go on and do a little bit more reading here. It says, Mr. Biden's remarks coming amid a wide-ranging discourse on American politics quickly appeared in Republican advertising. The local Democratic Party pleaded with Mr. Biden to repair what it saw as a damaging error, to no avail. On November 6th, Mr. Upton defeated his Democratic challenger by four and a half percentage points. So like I said, this race was uh, you know, super neck and neck. And then Biden comes and gives a speech in front of a bunch of Republicans. You know, not outright endorsing this Republican candidate because that would amount to you know political suicide, right? But, um, you know, saying he was a great guy and stuff like that. And then these Republicans took it and created ads with it and spun it all across the state or the county or whatever. And, you know, in a neck and neck race like that, because American electorate is so fucking politically illiterate, um, you know, an ad like that where you have a more very moderate Democrat on the fence between these two because maybe he doesn't agree with some of the issues that the Democrat is running against the incumbent, you know, Biden coming out and saying to these moderate Democrats, um, hey, this guy's okay, it's okay. You know, that's tantamount to giving, you know, these voters a little pat on the head, say, go ahead, you can vote Republican, you know? Got some more reading from this one here, from the New York Times article. It says, the speaking contract for Mr. Biden's October appearance in Michigan suggests that the popular Democrat would have known he was addressing a Republican-leaning crowd. The speaking series was underwritten in part by organizations connected to Mr. Upton's family. Like it said, like uh, like the article said earlier, uh, Mr. Upton's family is a huge um, contributor to this um, business-oriented civic organization, as they put it. Among the biggest sponsors listed on the Economic Club's website are the Whirlpool Corporation, which was co-founded by Mr. Upton's grandfather, and the Frederick S. Upton Foundation, a family charity named for the same man. The contract for Mr. Biden's visit shows he was paid $200,000 for his appearance, including a $150,000 speaking fee and a $50,000 travel allowance. $50,000 travel allowance. I could fucking vacation in Europe for three years for $50,000 fucking dollars and still pay my bills back home. It also specifies that the audience would be primarily older conservative Republicans and local community members, quote unquote. The document was disclosed in response to a FOIA request made by America Rising, 
a Republican group that conducts research on Democratic candidates. That's a weird little bit of intrigue there, huh? A business-backed Republican group defending Main Street, all capital letters, ran digital ads on Facebook showing a grin grinning Mr. Biden with the crucial quote, Fred Upton is one of the finest guys I've worked with, above a mock version of the former vice president's signature. So yeah, there's that article there. A uh, great example of the way in which Democrats will support Republicans with the I scratch your backs, I scratch yours, blah, blah, blah. Uh, graph, straight up being paid, speak of big banks, things like that. This is stuff we all know, but it, it's a good example of making it clear. Now, how does this relate to the abortion rights issue, okay? Well, in order to do that, we need to know who Mr. Fred Upton is. This is from Congressman Fred Upton's uh, political campaign website. It says, protecting the sanctity of human life. As a pro-life member of Congress... I oppose the misuse of federal taxpayer dollars for abortion services and support the conscientious rights of our nation's health care providers. As chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee, I have worked to pass legislation such as former Representative Joe Pitt's Protect Life Act to permanently codify restrictions on federal abortion funding, I have supported both the successful ban on partial birth abortion and the passage of the Unborn Victims of Violence Act, which recognizes an unborn child as a legal victim for fuck's sake, and have supported the efforts to criminalize the circumvention of parental notification laws. How about that? Not only is he pro-life in the vein of Tim Kaine where he beats around the issue about it, he advocates on a serious level using his power in the Congress to restrict abortion rights, to restrict abortion financing funding from the federal government. I want to, and we'll get into this more later, but um, I want to make a quick comment before we jump into the next thing about federal funding of abortions. Okay, um... Now, if you're more moderate, you might say, well, hey, that's a good compromise. Um, we protect the right of abortion for a woman's right to choose abortion. We just don't need um, any federal taxpayer dollars going to fund uh, the murder of babies to fund abortion. Now, the problem with that is this, okay? You know, everyone should have the right to choose if they want to have an abortion or not, right? But who is it that needs abortions most or who leans towards having abortions the most? Okay. Uh, who's having an abortion? It's people that, by and large, cannot afford to have a child. Having a child, they're already in economically disparate conditions. Having a child might as well be an economic death sentence in this country. Okay. So who is it that needs abortions the most? is the people that can't afford them without federal spending going to clinics that will support abortion rights, that will provide abortions free of charge or for a mitigated cost. Okay, so I just want to make that comment there. Yeah, so like I said, that's um, Joe Biden supporting a pro-life candidate who has not just taken a sort of conscientious, oh, I support babies' rights or whatever the fuck they believe in, uh, he has actively used his power as a congressman to push through legislation that limits a woman's right to choose. Okay, so there's Joe Biden doing that, getting paid $200,000 to support a candidate, a Republican candidate that's going to push through anti-abortion measures. Okay, but that's not all we have. We have this here from the Texas Tribune. It says, Nancy Pelosi affirms support for U.S. Rep. Henry Sweller after FBI raid, primary runoff birth. The U.S. House Speaker said during a stop Wednesday in Austin that she, ha that she always supports her incumbents from right to left. That's not a good look. That's not a good look on two accounts here. Now, I didn't have more information about the FBI raid, but um, if I was a politician that was at all concerned about keeping my seat because it's not completely rigged as in the case of nancy pelosi i probably wouldn't go out and support a guy that was under an fbi investigation hmm. i'd have no idea what the fbi investigation is about or what the raid was about or what they found but that's something that happened recently 
The other bad look here is I always support her, my incumbents from right to left. Ain't the Democratic Party supposed to be the left? What do you mean you're going to support right-wing incumbents? There's right-wing incumbents in the Democratic Party? Huh. Let's do a little reading here, huh, guys? It says U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi affirmed her support Wednesday for U.S. Rep. Henry Sweller, Democrat of Laredo, who was forced into a primary runoff earlier this month after the FBI raided his home. Quote, unquote, I support my incumbents, Pelosi said during an unrelated news conference in Austin. Quote, unquote, I support every one of them from right to left. That's what I do. Yes, we know, Nancy Pelosi. Safeguarding the interests of capital. Sweller, a centrist Democrat, is in the runoff against Jessica Cisneros, the progressive challenger who ran against him in 2020 and lost by a small margin. Pelosi visited Laredo and campaigned for Sweller, which she did not do this time. So back in 2020, um, let's see here. What's her name? Cisneros. Sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Was a progressive challenger, presumably running on things like Medicare for all, you know, actual left leaning issues. And, you know, Pelosi took a day out of her busy schedule of eating gourmet ice cream and, uh, getting insider information for her stock trading uh, husband to come and support a right-wing Democrat instead of a progressive, just like I was saying at the beginning of this video. This is one of the reasons why they support pro-life candidates, uh, right-wing candidates. It's because they don't want anybody to actually threaten um, the interests of capital within the Democratic Party establishment, which, again, is why the Democratic progressive electoralism strategy we've been encompassing with Bernie and the squad and shit is a complete dead end, but we can get into that later, right? Here's another one from Texas Tribune. It says, campaigning for Henry Sweller, a Democratic U.S. House leader, says party shouldn't shun abortion opponents. This is in relation to the other Texas Tribune article. It says, House Majority Whip Jim Clyburn visited Texas to stump for Sweller this week ahead of his runoff race. The trip fell two days after Politico published a leaked draft opinion from U.S. Supreme Court that favors overturning Roe v. Wade. All right, so what do we have here on this one, huh? Uh, not just Nancy Pelosi, House Majority Whip Jim Clyburn um, went to stump for Sweller as well. And he makes it very clear that, um, you know, Roe v. Wade abortion rights isn't a big deal. Uh, he went and stumped for this guy who's a pro-life Democrat, even though Roe v. Wade was just about to release their uh, memorandum saying that Roe v. Wade had been overturned. So, you got that. There's two... Two examples, uh, just with this one guy, of Democrats coming out to support him, and then obviously we have uh, the example that I shared from Joe Biden himself. In relation to this as well, the Henry Sweller thing, uh, the House leader saying party shouldn't shun abortion opponents. They're saying, they're saying that abortion isn't that big of a deal to be a Democrat. You can be anti-abortion, you can be a forced birther. We don't care as long as you're a Democrat that supports corporate interests. Uh, we have Nancy Pelosi here in this in this uh, article and then in her fundraiser here supporting the same exact thing. says, this is Pelosi from 2017 here. Pelosi, Democratic candidates should not be forced to tow party line on abortion. So you don't have to follow the party platform of supporting, uh, supporting abortion rights. Says the Democratic Party should not impose support for abortion rights as a litmus test on its candidates. House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi, Democrat of California, said Tuesday because it needs a broad and inclusive agenda to win back the socially conservative voters who helped elect President Trump. This is the Democratic Party. This is not a rubber stamp party. Pelosi said in an interview with Washington Post. Post reporters. Um, yeah, so what does this mean? Um, it means that the Democratic Party isn't what it says it's about. Plain and simple. Do you have pro-choice candidates in the Democratic Party? Yeah. But they're pro-choice candidates because they're coming from districts that are pro-choice. And they need to be pro-choice in order to get the votes in those districts. Or for that senatorial seat. 
It's not because they give a flying fuck about it. I mean, how much clearer does it need to be? Democratic candidates should not be forced to toe the line on abortion. They don't give a fuck about the issue. They care about winning seats so they can line their fucking pockets with corporate cash. It's right there in fucking writing. And then we got this most recent email. I got this one myself because I fucking, during the Bernie campaign, I somehow ended up on the Democratic Party email list. Pelosi from a fundraising email sent on 6-24-2022. I need your immediate attention. Trump's Supreme Court just ruled to rip reproductive rights away from every single woman in this country. I don't say this lightly. How we act today will decide the future of reproductive rights. We can either sit back and admit defeat to those far-right extremists, all in bold red letters, here we have it, or we can rise up and meet this once-in-a-generation moment and marshal a response so historic that we make every last anti-choice Republican, not anti-choice Democrat, regret what they've done. Please, I've never needed your support more now than today. Can you chip in $15 so we can win these midterms and finally codify reproductive rights into law? Who's going to codify reproductive rights into law? The anti-choice Democrats that you're stumping for instead of progressives? They don't give a fuck. Like I said at the very beginning, it got evidence and evidence and evidence already. And we're only a quarter of the way into this fucking video. It's about making money. It's about getting pro-corporate candidates in, even if it means fucking over progressives that will actually defend abortion rights. It's been generations of this shit. If you ain't on board and you don't see what the fuck the game is, you're you're a dumbass. Had to censor myself there a little bit because I want to say a lot worse. But you're a dumbass. Now, we've discussed some of the more recent, uh, over the last five years or so, some of the more recent strategies that Democrats have taken uh, to defend their own party interests and in turn corporate interests uh, by, you know, sort of waiving abortion as an important issue. Uh, but like I said, this has been going on for generations. This is, this is them playing politics over and over again and making these promises uh, only for the result of their playing politics to end up with us having no ammunition and no teeth to protect reproductive rights as well as other rights. Okay. So I have this post here says, remember when Obama had a supermajority and promised to codify Roe v. Wade into law, then never took up the issue again, instead making Romney care federal policy and bailing out banks was his priority? I remember that. I was, I'm, uh, I'm old enough now to remember it personally. Remember when RBG was asked to retire after an early battle with cancer, but she refused, hoping that Hillary Clinton would be elected to pick her successor as a symbolic victory for women? That was a good one, too. I remember that. This is a bipartisan monster. Hillary even picked an anti-abortion running mate. You need to do more than vote. Protest and pressure your local and state governments and say, don't you dare. If voting and then being complacent worked, abortion wouldn't be in jeopardy because Obama would have codified it in the law when they had a filibuster-proof government that he was at the helm of. So this is the wider strategy. Uh, we'll get into some more of the more fine-tuned details of how this worked, including Obama um, not pushing to get Garland through uh, and the whole fuckstorm with RBG. This is the long-term game. Um, one of the aspects of the long-term game that we know of is what's going on recently uh, with uh, cinema and what's his fuck? I don't even give a fuck. I, don't, I can't remember. Sorry. Uh, the two Democrats that are blocking every fucking thing, right? Um, as was said in the earlier tweet as well, you know, Democrats play the hapless victim. Like they really wanted to do this for you, but they said, we didn't get the votes. We got this weird rule in the government that makes us so we can't vote. We got this block that used the filibuster. We're going to get into why each of these things is fucking absolute bullshit and is what we like to call political theater. Okay. It's about putting on a grand show of fighting the dragon of the Republican Party. 
But in reality, it's just a bunch of sidestep. It's a bunch of legalese. It's a bunch of double stick uh, speak and long-term political strategy to make sure that nothing gets done to protect working Americans from corporate class war. We have a little more going along with this same post to give you some perspective here. Actually, we lost Roe when Biden championed T Clarence Thomas for the court when Obama refused to protect it by passing a federal statute when he controlled both houses of Congress with a veto-proof majority, when RBG refused to retire, when the Democratic Party decided they could use this wedge issue as a cash cow for their fundraising. Just remember that when listening to all their fine speeches about protecting women's rights and asking for money. I hope you guys will remember it. So what are they, first thing we're going to get into here about this long-term system or strategy of fuckery. We got this here from the Washington Post. It says Anita Hill testified that Thomas had frequently sexually harassed her when she worked for him at the Department of Education and Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Biden, who failed to call witnesses who supported Hill's testimony, told ABC News last year that, quote unquote, quote, quote unquote, Hill did not get treated well. I take responsibility for that. Biden voted against the nomination. So what's this about? Um, this is, w when did this happen? Uh, Clarence Thomas, who wrote the draft majority uh, position that overturned Roe v. Wade, as well as a bunch of other stuff that goes along with corporate interests that you may not have even heard about. Maybe we'll do a video on that in the future. Um, so there was a hearing for Clarence Thomas as to whether he should be uh, validated as a Supreme Court uh, nominee. Uh, if he would become Supreme Court Justice, okay. Now, as it says here in the Washington Post article, Biden did vote against uh, Clarence Thomas being affirmed to the Supreme Court. But again, that amounted to a, a political or public relations standpoint, okay. He was one of the guys that was chairing that hearing, and, you know, I'm not going to get into the real nitty-gritty of this. You guys can dig it up yourself for a more nuanced perspective with uh, more fine details into it. But essentially, the case that's made here in this article and that others are making as to why Biden's responsible for Clarence Thomas being on Supreme Court is during the Anita Hill hearings where she talked about Clarence Thomas sexually assaulting her, sexually harassing her, there were, like another half dozen victims of Clarence Thomas's sexual assaults that he refused or for whatever reason did not bring to the stand. And now you'll hear, you know, centrist Democrats, establishment Democrats, uh, shit libs, we like to call them saying, Oh, well it's because the, the evidence wasn't there and it would have weakened the case. It's like, no man, no, I know you want to believe that, but this was just another example of political theater, like I said, of, oh, we're fighting, we're fighting back. But in reality, behind the scenes, they're doing half of what they could if they're doing anything at all. So if it wasn't for Democrats like Joe Biden, we wouldn't have Clarence Thomas on the court in the first place. Okay, And this isn't um, the only example of Democrats failing to act on the Supreme Court, uh, failing to have gumption or teeth to protect the Supreme Court from being taken over from right-wing extremists, okay? Um, this is something that goes on much further. We've seen it when Obama failed to get Garland through, and we'll talk about that here shortly as well. But before we get into that, we're going to talk about who Hillary Clinton chose as her uh, running mate for, what, 20, 2016? I think it was Tim Kaine, um, who is a pro-life Democrat. Okay, and it's he's somebody that has flip flopped and jumped around and beat around the bush on the issue uh, for political clout, you know, to make sure that he gets the votes. Like I said, if he's in one region or in one town, he knows more conservative. He starts talking about how he's pro pro life. If he's in a more um, liberal urban center, he starts talking like he's pro choice. Okay, so we have this here from the Washington Post says why Tim Kaine can oppose abortion and still run with Hillary Clinton. So here's a fourth example of a Democrat supporting somebody who's pro-life and then telling us later that they are going to do everything in their power to protect abortion rights here. So Senator Timothy M. McCain, Democrat of Virginia, listens to Democratic presidential candidate Hillary Clinton speaks during campaign rally at Florida, blah, blah, blah. Getting into the reading here, it says... Like many Americans, I am personally pro-life, but support the co core holding of Roe v. Wade. 
that women should be able to make their own decisions regarding reproductive health without unreasonable government in interference. This is a fundamental matter of conscience, and like many other such matters, it is not one that should be dictated by the state. Sounds reasonable, right? Just hang on. The same logic explains why I remain a supporter of the Hyde Amendment, just as I believe it is wrong for state laws to force women to carry a pregnancy to term against their will, I also believe it is wrong for the state to compel pro-life Americans to support abortions through their tax dollars. I believe that codifying Roe v. Wade and maintaining the High Amendment strikes a balance in, respect, in respecting the choices of Americans make regarding abortion. Nothing in the Women's Health Protection Act would undermine the Hyde Amendment. Okay, so there's a lot going on there. Um, the Hyde Amendment was a law passed some time back, or that was up to be passed some time back, that barred federal funds for being used to finance abortions on the state level, right? Now, we touched on this earlier. Um, it's great because you can, you can appeal to you know, pro-life people by saying, I don't support federal funds, right? And then be like, but I do support the right to choose. Now, this sounds great on, on, on one level, right? It sounds like a compromise in a deeply divided country. But again, like I said earlier, who is it that is needing abortions the most? It's women that can't afford to have a, ch a child and who sure as fuck can't afford the hundreds or thousands of dollars that are necessary to pay for an abortion. Okay? It's a form of class war, the Hyde Amendment is. Okay? And he goes here and he says, I don't support the state forcing a woman to not have the right to choose. Forcing a woman to carry a pregnancy to term. But if you have a government that has billions upon billions of dollars of resources and you're not using any of those resources to help the most vulnerable and economically disparate women in the country, you are, in essence, by inaction, by not funding these abortions, ensuring that the state does make sure these women have to carry a child to term. That's what it is. It's a roundabout way of forcing women to have children that they don't want or can't afford because they can't afford the abortion. That's Tim McCain. That's who Hillary Clinton, the supposed feminist fucking symbol, had as her running mate in 2016. And why did she have Tim Kaine as a running mate in 2016? Because she wants to appear to conservatives. Appeal to conservatives. That's what all this is. It's, again, I'm going to say it. And we'll probably say it a half dozen more times in this video. It's not about the social issues. The social issues are a way to bankroll fucking money. And they will flip-flop and bend and fucking co get complacent or amiable with whoever is against them in order to secure their political interests. Okay? Because what happens when you get into a position of political power? Okay? It's not just the nice salary, which is already good enough, would be fucking plenty for me. It's all the iron triangles, the deals with corporations, the graft, the political appointments, the money, 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 the political speeches. Okay? That's why they run for the office. It's not because they care about the issues. It's not because they care about working class people. We've seen that time and time again they will vote across, uh, against those interests. They will play political theater in order to uh, stemmy uh, mass appeal for those issues. They will do all this shit to stop working class issues from becoming law. They do this so that they can have the positions of power and stuff their fat fucking pockets. They're part of the political class. They're part of the political elite which is just right underneath the corporate capitalist elite. They work in tandem. That's what all this is about. If it isn't clear by now, I don't know, man. Just shut off the video because nothing else is going to get to you either. Now, another part of this strategy is, like I was talking about earlier, um, you know, not fighting back hard enough, not doing everything in your power to um, get things done, to appoint judges, uh, to push laws through, you know, they blame things like the filibuster. They say that they don't have the votes, things like that. Um, so one of the things that establishment Democrats will point to is when Obama was president, he could have appointed uh, a Supreme Court nominee that would have ostensibly protected abortion rights, things like Roe v. Wade, right? 
But then they said that, oh, because of the filibuster, because of uh, Republican meddling, we weren't able to do it. Okay, you'll hear them make this argument. Oh, it wasn't Obama's fault. It was Mitch McConnell's fault. It was Republicans' fault. We have this article here from the New Republic that breaks down piece by piece why that's a line of fucking bullshit, okay? It says, Obama can and should put Merrick Garland on the Supreme Court. The outgoing president has one final trump card, and he should play it. And obviously, as we're finding out now in 2022... He did not. All right, guys, let's read some of this New Republic article, huh? says, come January, President Barack Obama will be consigned to the sidelines as Donald Trump occupies the Oval Office and begins the work of dismantling his legacy. But there is one action that Obama could take on January 3rd, 2017, that could hold off some of the worst potential abuses of a Trump administration for up to a year. Obama can appoint his nominee Merrick Garland to the Supreme Court on that date in between the two sessions of Congress. Based on everything we know about Obama's temperament and politics, he won't resort to this. But given how Republicans relentlessly obstructed his efforts for eight years, he would be completely justified in playing one final trump card. And there's a cost to ignoring that card. The fact that Democrats prefer to maintain governance norms, even while Republicans break them time and time again, inescapably pushes the policy-making apparatus of the country to the right. That's what we've seen over and over and over again for decades, is Democrats refusing to play hardball for whatever reason because they want to adhere to this idea of polite governance, meanwhile the Republicans do every fucking sleazy fucking thing that they can. And why is that? It's because they serve the same interests. Democrats play good guys. Republicans play uh, bad guys. You've seen the good cop, bad cop, you know, regiment before. If you've seen a fucking cop drama, this is exactly what it is. Here's how it would work. Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution states, quoting here, The President shall have power to fill up all vacancies that may happen during the recess of the Senate. This has been used for Supreme Court vacancies before. William Brennan began his court tenure with a recess appointment in 1956. Any appointments made in this fashion expire at the end of the next Senate session. So a Garland appointment on January 3rd would last until December 2017, the end of the first session of the 115th Congress. Why January 3rd? Because the president's recess appointments powers were significantly constrained by a 2014 Supreme Court ruling. In a 9-0 decision in National Labor Relations Board v. Noel Canning, the court said that the president cannot appoint individuals to fill vacancies if the Senate holds pro forma sessions every three days. Though these concessions common since 2011 merely gavel in and gavel out the Senate chamber, they have the practical effect of keeping the Senate active, therefore blocking the recess appointment power. But even the court's most conservative members acknowledge that a president can make recess appointments during intercession recess, such as the break between the first and second year of Congress, or the break between outgoing and incoming coming Congresses. There simply has to be an endpoint there, as a metaphysical matter. Theodore Roosevelt wants to use a short intercession recess to make hundreds of appointments. So there you have it. I know that's a lot of uh, political jargon. But it's just an example of how if the Democrats will, really wanted to, they could bypass all the fuckery and get things done. They don't because they have a convenient excuse to support corporate interests by not acting. This is one example, guys. This is one example out of the many I showed you of Democrats going out of the way to fuck with abortion rights. Now imagine how many other fucking issues they fucked with through their parliamentary bullshit or their fucking backroom deals and scratching each other's back horse shit. Every single thing. Because they're the same fucking party appealing to two different population groups. Again, have you heard it yet? Do you understand it? That's what's happening. Okay. The Democrats aren't advocating for you. They're not advocating for abortion rights. They don't give a fuck. They're talking about it so that you vote for them and give them money. 
There's things they could have done to prevent this. They've had super majorities where they could have codified it into law. They could have supported progressive candidates that would actually make it so that financing abortions on a federal level would be you know, salient. And women that can't afford abortions could get abortions and not have to live in poverty because they have too many kids. They could have pushed through Supreme Court nominees, judgeships all around the countries and all the little fucking districts. There's shit they could have fucking done. There's shit they could be doing now on issues. They don't do it because they don't care about doing it. They don't care about abortion. They don't care about women. They care about fucking money. Wake up to it. <sighs> now, guys, I've talked at length here about all the different ways in which Democrats are fucking you. They're telling you one thing, and then they're fucking you in the ass, no Vaseline. I hope you like it. We've shown it to you. And, and just to be clear, the fucking half dozen or so or more things I've shown you here is just some of the examples. It goes on and on and on and on and on. But this video is already at an hour of me talking about their fuck shit. I wonder how many hours I would be sitting here talking if I took the time and poured through the records and saw all the interpersonal fuckery between Republicans and, and moderate Democrats. I wonder. You could write a book on it. I, I'm, I hope somebody does. A big fucking fat 400-page book of ways Democrats have fucked reproductive rights for women. And then turn around and send an email. We need $15. Please. Do gourmet ice cream is expensive. And I can't afford it. I can't afford my gourmet ice cream and fighting for abortion rights. I can't do both. And if I got to pick one, I'm going to do the abortion. I'm going to do the ice cream, not the abortion rights. So if you want me to have my ice cream so that I can fight for abortion rights, you need to send me 15 fucking dollars. So there it is. But we're going to switch gears here a little bit um, and talk about a few different things relating to abortion. Uh, we're going to talk about what the destruction of Roe v. Wade spells for women. Uh, and we're going to try to dispel some false narratives that we've heard on the left um, regarding abortion as well, particularly on the left, because I know we hear all sorts of things coming out of the right wing that we just automatically know are bullshit. Um, but you hear some things coming out of the left, too, that kind of hurt this movement or look at this movement in a false light, which maybe causes them not to fight as hard for it as they should. First thing here I want to talk about is this tweet from Louisiana Communist Party, Solidarity of the Comrades of Louisiana. We're here with you in Iowa. It says, the right to get an abortion is not identity politics or a distraction from class struggle. You cannot separate the struggles of any oppressed or exploited group for liberation from the class struggle as a whole. That's just dialectics. So yeah, this is something we kind of talked about in the Jane's Revenge video as well. Um, and I actually seen uh, somebody comment, uh, you know, along the lines of this fallacy that the Communist Party is talking about. Um, that Roe v. Wade is a distraction. It's meant to divide us along identity politics issues so that we fight with each other about this instead of taking on the economic status quo. Um, this is just false. Okay, this is a wrong way of looking at identity politics. And now I want to be clear about something. Identity politics has become a huge issue in this country. But it's not because the issues surrounding identity or intersectionality aren't legitimate and valid issues. It's because Democratic Party officials, because Republican Party officials, pundits, talking heads on the internet have weaponized these issues to get views, to get clout, to get revenue. Okay, they have taken very real systemic issues, issues of oppression, issues of human rights, and twisted them and smushed them up and fucked with them to such a point that they become ugly identity politics issues that are meant to divide. Okay, they have, but that does not detract from the reality that these issues are important for millions and millions of people. And as is said here with this Communist Party tweet from Louisiana, each one of these identity politics issues if you want to call them that, abortion, um, and, you know, black rights issues w with mass incarceration, trans issues, all these different things, they are little battles in the greater class war, okay? So 
how in specifics here how is abortion an aspect of the class war and not just an identity politics issue okay we already kind of touched on it because the poorest women in this country when they don't have access to abortion they are pushed further and further down into the socioeconomic ladder okay it is a class issue because having the choice to choose if you have a child or not is one of the biggest financial fucking decisions you will make in your life. And by taking that away from women, you are sending, you are relegating millions upon millions of women to a permanent underclass ship, a permanent second caste, a second class, second class citizenship. You are demoting them to economic servitude because in this situation, they have no choice but to take the lowest possible rung jobs. They're in perpetual poverty because they have mouths to feed that they didn't want to feed and have no meads to feed. Okay. just want to make that clear. Abortion is a battle in the class war beyond it just being a human rights issue. It's not an identity politics issue. Some people will frame it that way for their own political clout. But make no mistake, it is a battle in the class war. And we need to fight it with as much viscerality and grit and gnashing of teeth as we fight every other single class war battle. All right? All right, guys, I have this here for you, too. It's a little meme, a little artwork for you. It says, no woman wants an abortion as she wants an ice cream cone or a Porsche. She wants an abortion as an animal caught in a trap wants to gnaw off its own leg. That's some metal-ass shit here. Now, I'm bringing this up because people frame abortion as like, Obviously, on the right wingers, you have straight up slut shaming, uh, keep your fucking lays closed, bitch, shit like that. But you see ar an argument uh, like this taken by some people that call themselves leftists as well, man. And it's fucking gross. You know, you're relegating w women to these gender norms, half of the population, you know, and, and it's sick. And we need to dispel that. And we should make no room for people that think that way in this movement. You know, they, you know, particularly some men on the left, they look at it like, well, it's, they shouldn't have the right to choose. They should, if they didn't want to have a fucking baby, they shouldn't be doing sex, you know, and, it, and it's fucked up. Okay. Because women don't choose to have an abortion. Like they choose to go on a fucking shopping spree or to do whatever it is that a woman wants to do. They do it, as I said earlier with the communist party tweet as a huge decision in their life that is never Never once has anybody chosen to have an abortion. Like, oh, guess I'll abort this fucking thing. <laughs> what fucking world are you living in? Though? That's what you think is, is going on, man. It's, in, it, it's an intense medical procedure that involves things being put inside of your body, involves chemicals being put inside your body to force the uh, embryo out of your body, forces the womb to purge itself. You know, anybody that's had an abortion or if you know anybody that's had an abortion will tell you firsthand it can be seriously fucking traumatic. More so for some than others. You know, for some it may not be as big of a deal or it may not have as many um, health side effects as it does for some women that it uh, affects drastically. Beyond that, too, it's, it's, a, it's a health issue where sometimes women don't want to have an abortion, but they have to make the choose, choice to have the abortion because they know that they can be killed on, on the way out, that it's going to permanently change or destroy their body. It's not a fucking choice of, I want to buy a Converse sneakers instead of Adidas, man. It's a fucking choice of whether or not to have a fucking human being growing inside you like a little fucking parasite. And then having to raise it for 18 to 20 fucking years. Every day. It crying at you. Wanting to be fed. Needing to fed. To wipe its ass. It's a lot, motherfucker. And even when it's not a lot anymore because they're babies, they're always asking me questions. They're always talking to you about something. You never get any quiet. Just right now, I've been recording. I had to pause early. You might have noticed a cut because my kid knocked on my door and asked me a goddamn question. I'm working, kid. Anyway, I'm fucking around being silly, but it's a serious issue. And to, to classify it as some just mediocre personal choice, like you choose a different pair of sneakers or what to get to eat at a fucking restaurant is gross. Going along with that discussion as well, I have this post I want to read to you guys um, because I want to hammer home what it was like before abortion rights were codified into law. And you had this whole uh, patchwork 
of abortion regulations that made it exceedingly dangerous for women or outlaw, outright outlawed abortion and pushed women into desperate situations. It goes along with that quote I was saying. Um, you know, a woman choosing an abortion like a woman, or like an animal chooses to gnaw off its own leg when it's stuck in a trap. And this post here should give you some perspective on that. It says, before Roe v. Wade, I worked in a nursing home for a good while. Let me tell you some of the stories these 8, 70, 80, and 90 plus year old women told me. I kept telling my husband six kids was enough. After a while, I just started throwing them in the river. I knew it was my father's, so I just left it in the hole in the outhouse because she was raped by her dad. I just shoved dirt in its mouth and left it in the woods. I gave birth on my friend's couch. I don't know what she did with it. We never talked about it again. There are so many more, but I will stop here. I mean, did um, you can't force a human being to carry a child inside of them, and you can't force a human being to raise a fucking child, especially people that are in eco economically dire straits. I don't know if you've ever missed a fucking meal in your life and having no idea where the next one's going to come from, but it's fucking scary. Now imagine doing that with a kid that you didn't want and were scared because you couldn't afford. And, and you know, people will try to spin this post. This is fucking disturbing, man. People will try to just spin this uh, post as those women are fucking monsters. Where's their maternal instinct? If you think that maternal instinct is automatically kicks in, you're fucking dope. We need to be clear about something. Human beings are animals. We're part of the, you know, great ape species, uh, genus. Um, and sometimes, yes, biochemically, when a woman gives birth, there's supposed to be this switch that flips that cues the maternal instinct and the fucking hormones and I love this baby and I'll do whatever. I'll fight off a fucking jaguar for it. But that's not always what happens. Sometimes the opposite happens, and postpartum, uh, postpartum, sorry, um, fear, anxiety, irrationality kicks in, desperation, especially if you already have a, a whole host of economic factors looming over your back because we have no support for women or mothers in this country. And this is what happens: they leave them on a doorstep, or they kill them out of fear. And if you think you wouldn't do that, you wouldn't do something so monstrous, it's because you've never been really fucking scared in your life and know what a human being is capable of when they're terrified and they don't know what else to do. Okay? It's the same reason why we have such a high infant mortality rate in this country and, and so many high levels of uh, child abuse in this country. It's because when people are desperate and stressed and overworked and you throw a child into it, they lash out on that child. Completely normal, good, genuinely good-hearted human beings doing terrible things to their children because they fucking snapped. Because they can't handle it. And this is what we're pushing people into, man. By forcing them to have children. Forcing them to have babies. You think you're saving a life with this kind of legislation? Or this kind of perspective, you're saving a little embryo. You have no idea the fucking amount of suffering and hardship and pain and trauma you've, you're going to unleash with this. It's going to create so many human tragedies and human atrocities that here's four that we read you from one person's post having worked in a nursing home. Um, you know, just like with things like prostitution or drug use, you can't legislate these things into non-existence. All you can do is make them more dangerous and have more of a, a, a societal um, ill. Make them into more of a societal ill. You've done nothing to stop abortions. You've just made them more dangerous and uh, amplified the human pain and violence and tragedy that's going to be associated with it. That's all you've done. 
We should be clear about that. You know, we got this little one here I wanted to show it with you as well. If you can't afford to have a kid, don't have sex, quote unquote, like we were talking about earlier. So you think sex should be a class privilege. Going along with why this is a class, um, uh, a, a battle in the class war, guys. This is only going to this is only going to affect poor people and working class people who can't afford to get abortion. Um it's going to hurt them immensely. It's not it's not going to hurt rich people because they'll go out of country or they'll go to a state that can afford it cuz it ain't nothing. They'll make a little vacation out of it maybe. No, I don't want to be that blasé about it cuz even for wealthier people I'm sure it's a traumatic experience, but you understand what I'm trying to say. This is a class war. This is a battle in the class war. I want to say it again. They're creating a world where the wealthiest can have sex and do all this and not have to worry about it because the laws don't affect them. Just like the laws now. When, when some white-collar criminal in a fucking Giorgio Armani suit gets caught embezzling billions of dollars from the government or from a trust fund or whatever the fuck he does, does he go to jail? No. But you steal a fucking 25-cent pack of gum, you go to jail or the cops they fucking shoot you like george floyd because he used a fake 20 dollar bill apparently let's be real about what this is it's laws for poor people for working class people not for rich people switching gears here again guys um you know i i i've seen some arguments coming out of uh conservatives and christian dominionists talking about uh you know this this roe v wade thing's not a big deal it's just putting the power back into the hands of states instead of federal government, imperial edict, imperial overreach. Uh, these laws that are being cooked up are fucking ugly. I have this right here, guys. Now, I want to be clear, this is not an official law that's on the table right now. I mean, maybe it is now because when I was doing the research, it was several weeks before I actually got to recording this video. But this is an example of some of the laws that these Christian dominionists and wackos are trying to put through. I'm going to read this for you. Buckle the fuck up, all right? Have a drink of water, sit the fuck down, all right? So this is a draft of a potential bill. It says, unofficial document from the House of Representatives General Assembly of Kentucky. Section 2, a new section of KRS Chapter 311 is created to read as follows. So it's an addendum on an already existing bill. Sorry guys, it's a little hard to read here. It says, all women who are Kentucky residents and of childbearing age shall acquire a signed and notarized statement from a practitioner licensed pursuant to this chapter each month that states whether she is pregnant or not pregnant. If pregnant, the signed and notarized statement shall provide the status of the pregnancy. The woman shall submit the signed a notarized statement to the Cabinet of Health and Family Services each month. Any woman who fails to provide this monthly signed and notarized statement to the Cabinet shall be subject to arrest and fines. Any woman who is pregnant and fails to provide this monthly signed and notarized statement to the Cabinet will be fitted with an ankle monitor for the duration of the pregnancy in addition to any arrest and fines. It's just going back to states' rights. We're just giving the states the rights to fucking... That's what fucking happens when you let these crazy right-wingers that run the states make the fucking laws. And no, it's not a joke. And no, it's not a fucking fake. Do you want me to read it for you again? Every month a woman has to report to a fucking bureau if she's pregnant or not. If she is, she has to have monthly reviews on how the pregnancy is doing. If she fails to do that, she can be arrested or fined or put under house arrest with a fucking ankle monitor to make sure she doesn't run away to get a goddamn abortion. It's just a state right. This is the fucking world they're making, man. And not to use the cliche uh, Gilead uh, Association, but it's the world they're fucking trying to make, and it's spot on. 
This is a fascist, theocratic fucking state filled with corporate domination and patriarchy that these people are trying to make. They're trying to make one whole half of the human population of this country fucking slaves. This is the state right. There's nothing protecting people from this sort of abortion legislation now. Uh, I'm sorry, guys, but I mean, I just, it's fucking, this is the shit the Nazis did, man. Over and over again, each week, we see some new fucking Nazi legislation. This is one example of it. If you ever asked yourself what you do in 1930s fucking Germany, you got your answer. Because it's what you're doing now. What are you doing? That's the thing with Nazi Germany. They show the little bit of rebellion and the this and that, and they show people being filed away to their fucking doom. What they don't show you is the average, everyday German that just minded their own fucking business why this shit happened. Many of them didn't even see it. They kept going to work. They kept paying their bills. They kept going to church. And by the time it was over and the smoke was rising up out of the crematoriums, they were like, oh, fuck, I didn't know it got that bad. I just went to my job. So if you ever wondered what you're doing during the rise of the Nazis, it's what you're doing right fucking now, man. And just like then, the liberals didn't do shit. Who did do shit? It was the socialists. It was the trade unionists. It was the communists. And what did the Nazis do with them? They round them up. They put them in prisoner camps. They were the first ones to break in those fucking concentration camps. Got the cots nice and warm for everybody else. And the ones that wouldn't go to the camp, they shot them in the fucking street. We are two hops and a fucking jump away from that right now. And no, I'm not fucking crazy. It's all in place here now. We've talked about it in other videos. And what do we get? We get a bunch of protests. We got things like Jane's Revenge. I mean, we are so. If we don't get organized and fight this fucking thing, it's done. Anyway. On a lighter note, here's Goku. In a tweet, says the Constitution is made up. The Supreme Court is made up. We could literally push all those old people down a flight of stairs. We are literally all choosing to play by these dumb rules. Case in point, it's very true. Uh, we call ourselves a democracy, but we live in a society where fucking nine people appointed by presidents that serve for life dictate whether or not the laws we want to make are legal or not. Under the premise of safeguarding the Constitution. Yeah, fucking right. The Supreme Court's an illegitimate institution made to hold up, hold up systems of power. It's there to make sure that when working class people class people somehow do get electoral power um, nothing is done with it because while all the people on the Supreme Court might not be Christian evangelical dominionists they're all corporatists we saw this with FDR how much shit they fucking stra struck down that helped working class people um, and this is just another case why electoralism is a load of dick a big fat load of fucking hot dick you can have all the progressive wins and victories you fucking want. You got that Supreme Court there stopping it. And you got every fucking judiciary across the country ready to stop it. It doesn't work. We need to be clear about the fact that this entire fucking system, this liberal, bourgeoisie, capitalist democracy, capitalist republic, republic for the capitalists, by the capitalists, needs to be destroyed. This is not a people's government. It's not even fucking close. The, de the, the parties, the Democrats, Republicans, those aren't people's parties. The Supreme Court ain't a people's Supreme Court. The Congress ain't a people's fucking Congress. The state legislators aren't a people's fucking state legislators. And every step of the way, if you think you're going to win electorally, they got something in the way to fucking stop you. And guess what, man? If they can't fucking stop it, you somehow get in and you're on top of the hill going, yeah, we're going to do it. They'll fucking blow your head off in the back room of a fucking house or a, a building or a goddamn alleyway. 
That's the country you live in, man. The whole thing's set up to make sure that you don't have any fucking rights. But they got real good with that political theater. Real good. That political theater is so good. They almost got me believing I'm living under living in democracy sometimes. It's impressive. The biggest and most powerful fucking propaganda machine in human history. And they've got you duped. But yeah, guys, that's about all I have for you. But I want to end on a hope of no, uh, 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 on a, a note of hope. Jesus Christ, I can't talk today. Um, we're not laying down without a fight. People are fighting back, and I don't just mean a bunch of liberals in pink pussy hats marching. Which, I mean, I got my support for that. I, it makes me happy to see it. At least it has a uh, political propaganda purpose in doing those things. But we have people fighting back by real means, too. We have another issue from our girls at Jane's Revenge uh, coming out after Roe v. Wade was struck down. It says, your 30 days expired yesterday. We offered an honorable way out. You could have walked away. Now the leash is off. And we will make it as hard as possible for your campaign of oppression to continue. We have demonstrated in the past month how, in the past month how easy and fun it is to attack. We are versatile. We're a mercurial, and we answer to no one but ourselves. We promise to take increasingly drastic measures against oppressive infrastructures. Rest assured that we will, and those measures may not come in the form of something so easily cleaned up as fire and graffiti. Sometimes you will see what we do, and we will know that it is us. Sometimes we will. Sometimes you will think you merely are unlucky because you cannot see the ways in which we interfere in your affairs. But your pointless attempts to control others and make life more difficult will not be met passively. Eventually, your insurance companies and your financial backers will realize you are a bad investment. So there's another message of struggle coming out of Jane's Revenge and all the good women in there that are fighting back by any means necessary. Um... The later part, the latter part of that um, memorandum there. Um, let's see, what does it say? Sometimes you will see what we do, and you will know that it is us. Sometimes you will merely think you are unlucky, and then going on. Um, eventually, your insurance companies and your financial backers will realize you're a bad investment. That tells me that's going to take uh, maybe a hacking campaign of some kind is going to be involved in that along with the other things that we've seen them do in um, like we talked about in previous videos Sorry guys, I'm losing my voice <laughs> um, But there's people fighting back and You can fight back too However, it is you think you can however you have the means or the strength or the will to do so you should fight back They may win in the end, but we're not gonna just take it lying down and I don't know about you, but I'm willing to be a martyr in this movement if it comes to that. Um, because there are millions of women before this is all said and done that will be martyrs just from the act of this legislation. Or this Supreme Court ruling. So, but yeah, guys, that's all I have for you. I'm sorry it was super long. Um, I had a lot to cover. I hope that I've laid out for you the ways in which Democrats are a fucking dead end. That they're full of lies. Even on the social issues that we claim are important. They play the game. They take the graphs. They take the paychecks. They play hand in hand, in step, in tandem with Republicans and with corporate interests. And I hope also that I've made it clear to you that this isn't just an issue of it going back to states' rights. It's life or death for many millions of uh, women in this country. And we have an obligation to educate people like I'm trying to do here, to um, stand strong, to fight back. I don't care what you got to do. Uh, insert redacted action here. Do what you got to do fight back by any means necessary but yeah guys thanks for hanging out uh with me here uh thanks for sitting through this long video if you can please support me on patreon or paypal make a one-time donation to paypal one dollar two dollar three dollar four five ten whatever become a patron to support me long term um recently a lot of work has been going into these videos man i am not uh, getting any sleep it's uh, it's been a lot of labor i mean this is a long video with a lot of uh, anecdotes and a lot of discussion we're having here so you could please support my work on Patreon or PayPal. It would be greatly appreciated. Um, until then, guys, um, I'll speak to you again soon. It's been great ha hanging out with you, uh, and I love you very much. Bye for now. Bye.